I was going to start off with a little bit about CVCRM, um, but clearly there is no point. Justin has, Justin has done that much better than I could, but I, what, what I'm going to talk about, two, two features are open source and CRM. Before that, I'm just going to go a very quick bit about me. Um, believe it or not, that's Canberra. That's when I've moved to Canberra. That's for those of you who are locals, that's Yarralumla. That is very, very inner Canberra. Um, yeah, I went to uni, I went to ANU here and did economics because I was interested in social justice. I then ended up in Nimbin. This is the rainforest that we lived in, in, in Nimbin. And this is early protest. I'll talk a little bit about how we organised things then because we certainly didn't have CIVI or any other CRM. We didn't have computers. We didn't, didn't have, yeah, anything. I, I had 11 years up there, then back to the ACT and public service. This is where I worked. I, I worked in, I worked in IT. Again, open source. Hadn't even heard of it. It's not, but I didn't stay there forever. I, I left. I, I was the IT manager for an organisation called Australian Ethical Investment, who you may possibly have heard of. We now have two billion under management. It was obviously given its name. We were interested in ethics, and so open source was in fact part of our agenda. Um, from these days, I, I don't know if you can see. I'm wearing a Linux T-shirt, a, a rock art penguin. So this photo was as good as I could do for for, 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 for what to wear today. Um, so we, we tried to use, we used open source whenever possible. One of my staff was a keen Python developer and we, we, and contributed back and went to lots of the conferences. We started off, I don't, I don't know if anyone else is, with our website, if anyone else is old enough to remember Hot Dog, but, um, probably by the look of you, no, 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 once, uh, once there were open source website programs, content management systems, we, we, we moved on to an Australian one which worked, which worked really well. I also wrote our own software for managing our investors, which included a, a CRM. And at that stage, there were no commercial software that did what we did and included a CRM. It was still in the late 1990s. It, CRMs were still they weren't they weren't common as they as they are now. Then in two thousand and eight, I was elected to the ACT Legislative Assembly as a Green, obviously, and I ran on a platform of of climate change. Uh, we got four of us in unexpectedly. Uh, I I didn't get re-elected. Spent four years gap year, and then two thousand and sixteen, I was re-elected. Um, yeah, so, and with my work with the, with the ACT Greens, I certainly have had quite an exposure to, to CIVI, and I'll talk a little bit more about that late, later on. What I'll talk about now is free and open software. What is it, and, you know, what, why is it important? I mean, we can, the point is really, we can look at software in the same way as we look at other parts of science and human knowledge. I mean, we don't talk about, oh, there's open source maps, there's closed source maps. We don't talk about open source chemistry and closed source. Uh, possibly the closest one where I was thinking about it, we talk about there are some um, pharma health companies that have tried to patent human DNA, which strikes me as utterly appalling. But the, the point that I'm trying to make in virtually all fields of human endeavour, we don't talk about open source and closed source. It's all open source. It's, and basically what, what would, where we get closed source is from government intervention where government uh, gives the, the creator of the content a uh, limited m monopoly and intellectual property rights, a government um, fiat monopoly. Uh, so that's, and I mean, obviously there are reasons for that. It for it does cost money to create things, um, but what we're talking about really with open source and free software is whether or not the knowledge is how computers can be used to do good things, like CVCRM, should be free in the way that maths is free. 
Should, the way that biology, chemistry, etc., or history are free. Are we talking about whether knowledge should be ownable and whether people should be excluded from it? So this is why open source is not just something that you talk about from a you know, com com technical computing point of view. That's why people like me see it as part of a, a movement, and I imagine that I'm not the only person here who sees it as part of a a wider movement in terms of transparency and, f and freedom. Um, I mean, it's, it is a serious ethical issue, and not just for software. It's always taken real effort to create knowledge. It still does. Uh, all of the sponsors there, they're all commercial organisations. They all need income to do the good work they do for, for all of us. Um, but things have really changed. It's always taken money to create knowledge, but in the past, it cost, also cost a lot of money to reproduce that knowledge. When you had monks ri writing out copies of the Bible, you know, or whatever, it cost a lot. But now the cost of reproducing knowledge is really, really low. Um, looking at journalism, for instance, uh, it's always taken resources, human resources, to do good journalism, but it used to cost a lot to reproduce it. It doesn't anymore. We see it on the web for free. So... The, the, the business model that makes that work has to change. But still the moral case is if you can give everybody something of value or importance or, or knowledge, for the, if you can the same cost to give to everybody as to give it to a single body, what is the moral case for excluding anybody? If, you, if for instance, all the bread in the world you could be, make by making one loaf of bread, pressing a button and duplicating it, there'd be no moral case ever for preventing people and all hunger would be preventable. As a greenie, I'll make a brief observation that although it is very cheap to reproduce things dig digitally, it is only very cheap. There are no free lunches. Computer technology is estimated to use 2 to 3% of the world's electricity. And in 2008, which was the most recent figures I could find, if the internet was a company, a country, it would rank as the fifth largest for energy consumption. And of course, there's also pollution and e-waste issues. Um, but we, in this context, we can we can ignore it. So free and free and open source software provides the source code for free. It's digital but the human services of installation and support are provided financially for money, as in other things, and that's what the sponsors do. And the fact that the software is free can have great social positives because it, it enables, well, basically almost any organisation to have access to great world-class, high-quality software for, for free, which, which is... Brilliant, ethically. It may, it, you know, it's really democratised organising and, and social movements. Having software like Civi available for a price that, you, that we can afford. Uh, another uh, big positive is that, uh, from an equity point of view, big big companies don't make big profits from workers. And of course, as I said before, there is, there is with free software, there is a responsibility to give back to the community that's done the foundations for your work. The people who've made the free software still need to eat. As Isaac Newton said, if, I had, if I've seen further than others, it is by standing on the shoulder of giants. So we can look at it as if you're a consumer of software, you need to be it servers or whatever, you need to put back in it to it. Another plus with with free software is that you can examine it and play with it and learn how it works. And for many people, uh, actually coding is a creative exercise that they, that they enjoy. Um, and sometimes it's been so for me. Yeah, for the last 15 years though, the free software movement has largely marketed itself as, the open, soft, as open software and, it's, and it has stressed the practical advantages of open software more than the ethical advantages, which I've just been talking about. And, of course, there's lots of practical advantages. Transparent, you can see what's actually in it if you choose to put the time in. This is particularly important for security software or encryption software, but for all software, you really don't want, um, you really want to know what's in it. 
it's a source of great um, utility. When I first started in IT, which was in 1971 at, at uni, all software was bespoke. We used punch cards. Every problem was solved from first principles. Today is fundamentally different. Uh, what what you do in IT, what we do, you do in our IT, is combining and building on a huge body of work. A lot of that is open source. Blogging, content management, CRM, etc. exists. You can modify it and build on it. And the modifications in the case of, of software like Civi goes back to the community and everybody can use it. Um, and as I mentioned, of course, lower costs of ownership and there's a it's kind of gotten it's kind of gotten everywhere. Um, that's that's the black person that you may or may not recognise. You quite like probably half of you use. That's that's the an Android, which is obviously well, what is obviously is in fact built upon the Linux kernel and it's been uh, modified and distributed by Google. But it is it's it is, it is basically open source. Most of the web is run by open source. Between Linux and Apache, sort of. Got, it's got it sorted. Um, the next thing I want to talk about is from my experience both as an IT manager and as an IT user, which is that basically all users want is software that works. The discussions that I've just had about how great open source is and how equitable it is and how ethical and all that is, some people are interested in and some people are not. Um, yeah, as in, when in Australian Ethical as IT manager, I, I certainly promoted open source software as much as possible. And from our back end point of view, it worked really, really well. We had an open source content management system for the, for the web, for our web server as soon as one was, av was available. We used Linux for most of our servers and they worked really well. But we didn't use Outlook for email, and that was largely an open source ethical decision. It was led to considerable frustration on the part of the users, and after I left, so did the product that we were using. Uh, they, and I'll just talk a little bit about what's been happening with the Greens. And that New South Wales, I'm, I'll stress, I'll talk about it from my from my perspective as someone who's basically involved with ACT Greens. New South Wales Greens have had different ex experiences. And when I was first involved in the Greens, obviously we didn't use Civi CRM, we didn't use any, we had, we had lists, and then we moved up to, up, to the, up to spreadsheets. And then we moved up to Civi, to Civi, which was a brilliant step forward. And we in the Australian Greens were using this for many years. Um, so I've been a user of Civi CRM for on and off fashion for many, many years. The Australian Greens use Civi to manage donations, event registrations, enable login to the members-only websites, send out bulk emails to members and volunteers, and the ACT Greens um, did the same. Um, and I, I believe that throughout the Greens, most... Um, state groups have, a, have you, I think they all use Civi CRM and some of them use some other products as well. But I think in this context it's important to reflect that at present the ACT Greens currently you primarily use Nation Builder. Uh, those of you who haven't heard of Nation Builder, it's an American software, it's specifically designed for political and advocacy groups. It does have an allegiance, I understand. I understand a few years after I started knew about it with the Republican Party, but it, it, it basically is a CMS and a CR, CRM all integrated. It started being used in the ACT Greens in 2013. It ran our 2013 federal campaign, and then because people got used to it, it, it it's continued. It moved into the ACT Greens basically for two reasons. One, that there was a small group of people who had used it elsewhere who became involved, and so their familiarity was with this piece of software and they didn't want to learn Civi CRM because it would have been learning for them, whereas they knew the other. The other, And the other thing was there was one 
functionality lack in CIVI CRM, which has been fixed by then. It was it was processing online donations at that stage. AC2 Greens did all this manually. One of our volunteers would 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 do that offline, but we we were certainly of the belief that we couldn't do it with CIVI, and that's. It is unfortunate, and particularly it's unfortunate because as a result of that, I know of at least two organisations who are using, who are not using CIVI, who, who are using the old nation builder because a person moved from, from ACT Greens to these other organisations. This was what he knew. So that's, that's what he, he did. I mean, I think it is, un, I think it is really unfortunate, but it's something that those of us who are, Developers need need to remember your users. They just usually aren't that concerned about what it is that you're actually running. They they just they just want it. They just want it to work. I was talking to someone before, and they said that what before this morning, and they said that what they had done, which had worked really really well, was instead of saying your our system is CIVI CRM, they said. This is our corporate database, and and that reframing seemed to work better because I'd have to tell you that Civi was being blamed for lots of things that was in no way Civi's responsibility. It was the fact that the Greens basically didn't have the money to put into the IT infrastructure, so it was easier to blame the product than than to think of the reality of the lack of resources. Anyway. Uh, and, and enough, enough of that. But I guess I, I'm speaking a little bit from some um, not always very positive experiences, which hopefully things will do better for you. But we're going to go on a little more positive here. There's lots of things in the world apart from software that should be or can be, in, or in fact, in this list, are open source. Now, news is one of the really important ones. Uh, but really, all news should be open. Should be open source. We know we've got a problem with fake news, and we, you know, Julian Assange, Edward Snowden, and Chelsea Manning, among others, have have been really great in terms of more transparency for that government operations. There's clearly need for more. When the media uses anonymous sources, um, then you end up with a situation that Trump and other politicians call the story fake news. The People don't have any way of evaluating for themselves. Is is this true? Is this false? They've got no idea who to trust. And we we could talk at length about what this has done for our democracy. I will I will leave it at that. But certainly, news is something that absolutely needs to be free and open sourced. And an organisation that's doing its bit towards that, of course, is, is Creative Commons. I imagine you're all aware of that. If you're not, it's a, it's a way of facilitating creators of content to spread their, to have their content spread, used by other people, still respecting the rights of the original crea creators, but letting it go out into, into, into the universe. And you'll see an awful lot of it on the web, particularly in terms of images. Uh, I would imagine that almost certainly everybody's website has got some Creative Commons licensed images on them. And if it, um, it's got it, yeah. In 2010, I successfully moved the motion which committed the ACT government to distributing all its data and reports for a Creative Commons license. I mean, the idea is basically being the community's paid for it, the community should be able to use it. And using the same argument, the Australian government has encouraged all of its agencies to make its data, their data available with an appropriate Creative Commons license on data.gov.au website. And I imagine that some of you have, are using data from that. If the data is described as open, it means anyone can access, use or share it. And since 2013, the Australian government has over 7,000 data sets published on, on open.gov, sorry, data.gov.au. The Greens, of course, use these data sets with CIVI CRM. Being a political party, we have a great advantage. We're, we're, al we're allowed to use the electoral data which we have, which we have used. Well, I shouldn't say have. We have and are using uh, 
because we can use it for political purposes. Uh, our workers have created a door-knocking program called Jeevas, which uses Civi CRM as the back end, and, to, um, and I imagine that other groups have done similar things. Uh, Wikipedia, um, you're all aware of, of Wikipedia. Uh, this is, again, a big open-source free project. It allows... It's, it was specifically created for that. And you may not be aware of, because I think most of you are not ACT people, the ACT elections. ACT elections are run by open source software. Uh, we first started doing this in 2001, and it's been used ever since. I believe that we are the only jurisdiction to use, to use in fact, any software for all, all counting or preference distribution and counting of votes. The Senate now used, for last election, the Senate used it for that, I think, but we also now use it for the, the paper ballots are all scanned and the preferences taken off them electronically. And again, that's, that's open source software. What we do is we don't use the internet at all. Their electronic voting is, is done only at a, a small number, the pre-polling booths, PCs are used as terminals, and there's a local area net network. This is so that no one can. There is no possibility of internet hacking. Uh, it's it's all you know USBs and and CDs and well actually CDs not USBs because they burn the one for CDs because you can't easily change it. So it's all designed to be hard to hack rather than necessarily. The easiest. It's incredibly popular in the ACT. About 30% of, of our votes are, are counted in the electronic. Uh, are, are about 30% of, of people vote electronically. And because of that, and because we have electronic software that distributes the preferences, despite the fact we have a hair clerk system like the Senate, we have no how to votes. We have a thing called Robson rotation, which says that every ballot paper is potentially different. You, you have for, a, like I'm standing for the Greens. Sometimes I was on the top of the column. Sometimes I was at the bottom. So despite all these things, which make it very difficult, on the night of the election, we basically know we basically know the result, except for one or two seats. I've always been in the one or two seats that were not sure on the night, but. It's character building, people say. Uh, so, I'll, look, I'll now talk a bit more about why, why you're actually using the software rather than the open source part of it. Um, I, I don't know where you're all from, but I, I, I imagine that most of you are from organisations who are trying to improve the world in one way or the other, and that's why most of us get out of bed every day. So I just thought I'd do a quick go through of some of the problems that we that we are, are looking at. And clearly, asylum. I know, I know there are people here working on asylum seeker issues. And on that, I'll just let you know that the ACT Greens recently successfully moved a motion seeking, asking the federal government to immediately remove all refugees and asylum seekers from Manus Island and Nauru bring all refugees and asylum seekers to Australia to be resettled in Australia's 148 refugee welcome zones where they can build new lives within the, this network of compassionate and caring communities committed to upholding their rights and declare that the ACT government is willing and ready to help settle refugees and asylum seekers from Manus Island and Nauru in Canberra as part of the national program of resettlement. And it was passed with support of the Labor Party. The Liberals, interestingly, abstained. Uh, next, climate change. That's why I've stood these times. We all know it's happening. Try to forget about it. Um, bees, I put that partly because it's, be it's a beautiful picture. Um, and we do we, bees, we do have a bit of a problem with bees in the world. They're getting too many pesticides, not good for them. Next is Drew Yoga. I know there's a presentation from Drew Yoga shortly after me. If we did Drew Yoga, if we did yoga more often, uh, we'd all have a less, lot less problems, both us and the world. So the question is, how are we going to fix all these, all these problems? And this is a small sample of them. How are we going to get asylum seekers to safety, stop you, climate change, stop killing the bees, stop injustice and war, stop degrading the planet and do more yoga? 
The common thing with all of these is they are human problems. They are not techni technical problems needing some amazing technical solution. If they were, CIFI CRM probably wouldn't be part of the solution, but they're human problems and so CIVI CRM undoubtedly can be part and for all of you is part of, this, of the solution. Before modern IT we organised differently, that first photo you, I, I showed you of, of, of a forest demo, that was entirely word of mouth. It wasn't even, even we didn't even use phone trees because we didn't have phones, but we, all, we were protecting the forest that we, li that we lived in. Uh, when I moved back to Canberra, we used telephone trees and we used, then we had spreadsheets of people's ring up. It works, but it takes an awful lot of effort and an awful lot of time and you probably, and we need to, we need to work better. We need to do more. I'm not a CV ex expert. I have used it. I'm not going to talk about precisely what you're going to do with CV. That's the rest of the, of today. I'm going to talk a little bit about the sort of things that um, are relevant regardless of how you exactly use your software. But once you get a reasonable number of people, you've got to have help in organising them. You have Looking at your volunteers, you need to know who they are, how to contact them, where they live, what they've done, what they, what they like to do. And you need to make your volunteer process something that your volunteers can do. It has to be easy to do. And you have, you have to do, do enough that you know to thank people, because that's one of the really, really important things of keeping a volunteer organisation going. You've, we, all, we all need to get some sort of recognition, and if it's not in dollars, it needs to be in, in some smiles and achievement. And uh, Your donors, of course, are equally important. Without donors, even on a low-cost organisation, without donors, you're probably not going to be working. You need to be able to take their money, you need to be able to receipt it, you need to be able to give them that pro probably, hopefully, tax-deductible receipt, receipt. So you need to be in a position that if, uh, you can be audited if, if it happens like that. And so CIVI will let you take your donations 24-7, acknowledge and receipt them. As a political ca candidate, of course, I was most interested in, ha in persuading people to vote for me and the other Greens candidates. And there has been a lot of work done about how, how do you do this. But the bottom line has, is everyone agrees with. The thing that changes people's minds is having someone that they trust talk to them about something. Uh, and so that's kind of what we tried to do in our campaign. We, we Obviously, different parties have different views as to who they're going to target and what they're going to say, but we, we worked on getting as many people as we could out to have meaningful conversations with people in our electorates. Um, in the last election, the Greens contacted over 50,000 Canberra households knocking on over 22,000 doors and, and ringing over 31,000 homes, which enabled us to have over 11,000 in-depth conversation. We had over 1,000 volunteers and five neighbourhood teams. We, we did this, as I said, br uh, briefly I mentioned Jeeves, which is built on, on CIVI CRM but uses electoral data as, as well. We, we needed this to, to do walk lists so that people knew where they were walking. We, we used it to record who we'd actually visited because the last thing we wanted to do was inadvertently double up. We used it to record what people were interested in so that if people were saying we're really concerned about climate change or, really, or whatever it was, we could make sure that our volunteers knew about it and our messaging ad ad addressed that. Without CIVI, we simply couldn't have done it. It was, you know, the tool that made it do it. We we had a, yeah, the, we had a core team of volunteers who used Civi CRM. We had one person who'd uh, resigned from the public service and basically worked effectively full time as as our data lead, and that that was how important managing our data, managing our volunteers, managing our conversations was to doing. 
Like all political parties, uh, the Greens have been, were influenced or have been influenced very much by Obama's 2008 campaign, and it used the snowflake model of organising, which I won't fr- go through in great detail, but it's basically saying you start from the middle and then you, you talk to a group, then you empower and, and talk to another group, and then they so you're going from the blue out to the green to the purple, you're going out and out and out with more and more people each way. And the this is decentralised organising. It, it encourages everybody to use their own leadership potential. I imagine that some of you are using models like that. Um, one of the reasons in the past that we've had more hierarchies and central control has been the difficulty of organising and the difficulty of sharing knowledge and resources. Software like Civi makes makes that a lot easier and makes this sort of thing possible. Now, as Martin Luther King once said, injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. We are caught in an inescapable network of mutuality tied in a single garment of destiny. Whatever affects one directly affects all indirectly. That's, I'm sure that's what everybody here feels. That's what our volunteers feel. That's what much of our community feel. That's why when we speak, people listen. And it's, they, they listen, they vote, they sign petitions, they help organise, and they do yoga. My last little, pl- no, it's not, no, don't, don't laugh, it's really important. This is my last little plug. One of the things that's really important for the, commu- the community of the NGOs, the community of people who want to change things, is that we've got to look after our community, we've got to look after ourselves. Burning help out doesn't, doesn't help you and it doesn't help anyone else. Spending some time doing yoga, bushwalking or whatever. I mean, Drew, Drew Yoga is, is part of this, is really important, which is also why CIVI is important because it's a way of doing things better, more easily. So I hope today that you're going to have some conversations that inspire you and show you better ways of doing things. And thank you very much for the privilege of talking to you.